Hi there, I'm Martino, and in this video, I'm going to relive my adventures in Krakow and let you guys know if it's a city worth visiting for a footy trip. Let's do this. After a panicked sprint, I use the term loosely, through the airport, my fear of missing the flight was allayed by the sight of a full queue waiting at the gate to board the plane headed for Krakow. I was returning to Poland's second city some 12 years after first visiting for a stag do. This time, I was hoping to have a slightly more cultural and rested experience after a heavy weekend in Belgium. The two hour flight was nicely passing by until the final descent. The seatbelt light was on and the staff was strapped in ready for landing. On the other hand, I was starting to feel nauseous so I made a dash for the bathroom, only to be told in not so many words, sit the fuck down by the previously delightful air hostess. The next ten minutes hovering over an insufficient sick bag were about as grim as it gets. Approaching Pope John Paul II airport, I was hoping for some divine intervention from the great man who ended Italy's 455 year streak at the top of the Catholic Church. Thankfully my prayers were answered and the body held up. There is a god after all. Leaving the airport in slightly better shape, I jumped on the 25-minute bus to the centre. That lasted all of one stop before the same feelings returned and I was forced to jump off before any further embarrassment ensued. One thing I was looking forward to this week was long river walks, enjoying the fresh air and freedom. However, I hadn't envisaged starting so soon with a three-hour walk from the airport, but hey, why not? An unexpected opportunity to see the less touristy areas of Krakow. Day two began feeling slightly fresher. I'd love to say two-day hangovers aren't a thing, but who am I kidding? A light stroll around the old town was just what I needed, and wow, what an incredible city. Having been before, I wasn't expecting to be overwhelmed, but the old town was something to behold, and my hazy 12-year-old memories were put to shame. Stunning architecture and history around every corner, with the oldest medieval square in Europe as a centrepiece. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name. No surprise that it was one of the first landmarks to be added to the UNESCO's list of World Heritage Sites back in 1978. Full of life and energy, this place was buzzing with activity. People of all ages and walks of life enjoying the ambience. Such an incredible place with so much history, it was time to find out a little more. Evidence of settlements on Vavil Hill on the banks of the Vistula River, the Vishva, date back thousands of years, but the existence of Krakow itself began in the 7th century. Legend has it that a young man named Krax slayed the local dragon Smog Vavelski, who had been plaguing the city. He then became king and ruled over the Vestulan tribe, and by the end of the 10th century, Krakow was incorporated into Poland. In 1038, Krakow became capital of the relative of the new country and retained that position until the late 16th century when it moved to Warsaw. During the first 900 years of Poland's existence, they have had wars and invasions from the Mongols, Swedes, Russians, Ottomans and even 123 years of Austrian rule that took them up to their eventual independence in 1918 at the end of World War I as part of the Treaty of Versailles. Tragically, just over 20 years on, Krakow was one of the first places to be invaded by Nazi Germany. Here, the Nazis set up their general government and occupied the country for the duration of the war, and sent millions of Jews to their deaths. At the end of World War II, Poland were under communist rule where they remained for the next 45 years until the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1991, in which the Poles themselves played a crucial part. And finally, freedom. Selecting matches is always a fun part of the adventure, and this time after booking my trip to Belgium, it was a case of seeing where there was a set of midweek fixtures, and whether it was affordable to get to. Thankfully, Krakow ticked both these boxes and Wisła Krakow vs GKS Katowice jumped us straight out. I had to wait until a few weeks before the game before tickets were available to buy and to my shop the extra class of fixtures were nowhere to be seen. After a brief panic, it appears both of these well-known teams were now applying their trade in Poland's second tier, but at least the game was on. A couple of days before my trip, I was searching for information about Wisła and spotted that they were one of the clubs available on homefans.net. A site I'd been meaning to try for years, where you basically have a host who tries to give you the full home fan experience, as the name suggests. For only £45, I bit the bullet and was almost instantly in contact with my host and avid Vishra fan, Philip. On the day of the game, we met a few hours before kickoff in town and walked the 30 minutes to the ground, where I asked him a whole host of questions about Vishra and their current form. And as always, it was great to learn about the history of a new club. Vishra Krakow were formed in 1906 in the same year as their great local rivals, Krakowia. Both were founder members of the Polish Championship. They went on to win their inaugural title in 1926 and quickly followed up with a second the year after. Vishwa failed to continue their early dominance and barring a couple of successes in the 1950s, it was quite until the 1978 title. The following year, they reached their best court European finish of a quarter-final before falling to eventual winners Malmö. As the 20th century was coming to a close, they were struggling at the foot of the extra class when the club's course was about to change dramatically. The first big-money takeover in Polish football by one of the country's richest men catapulted Vishwa back to the upper echelon to the table. Within half a season, they were beating reigning champions Wisła Lodz 6-0, and by 1999, they once again reached the pinnacle of Polish football, and this time there was no budging them. Wisła proceeded to dominate the league, winning eight of the next 13 titles. If ever you're partaking in a quiz and the following question comes up, to whom did Pep Guardiola of his first managerial defeat? The answer, I'm sure we all knew, is Wisła Krakow. 
Since their final title in 2011, it has sadly been a steady decline. Results on the pitch began to suffer and by 2016, the affluent owners decided they'd had their fun and departed, leaving Vizra in a terrible state. Back in debt and in the hands of the fans, this exposure left them vulnerable and their famous right-wing ultra group, the Sharks, managed to infiltrate the club. This accelerated the club's downfall with continued criminal activity. By 2018, the club was on its knees with fans just praying for the club to survive. The saviour ended up being former Dortmund star Jakob Blazikowski. As well as turning out on the field, he also combined with others off the field to put together a package to rescue the club. Despite being able to save them from extinction, he was unable to stop the drop to the first league after 26 years at the top level. Back to the match day and with no bars in the locality of the stadium, it was some cans of beer and supplementary vodka from the local shop before gathering in the car park opposite the stadium. Philip understandably emphasised how 6 o'clock on a Tuesday kickoff wasn't going to give me the full pre-match experience, but as the fans assembled and the vodka flowed, the atmosphere was building nicely. As time ticked along, we headed across to the Stadion Mieski Henry Karemana, their 33,000 capacity stadium which has been home since 1953. Named after one of the club's greatest heroes, top scorer in their first two league titles and still to this day, the record holder of the most goals in one extra class a season with 37. A man whose influence on the club is still felt with the following quote displayed in the Vizfa dressing room. No one requires you to win everything. You might lose at times, but everyone has the right to require you to fight unrelentingly and ambitiously. Do not let people consider you unworthy of shaking your hand. Suitably well oiled, I was now well in the mood for a lively experience. We entered the fortress where Vizra won to end five years without defeat and took our place in the terrace. I say took our place rather than seat as not one fan behind the goal sat down for the next 90 minutes. A huge TIFO covered the stand as the game kicked off and underneath, the Ultras quickly changed clothes and put on masks and gloves. It was certainly an environment with an edge where photos and videos weren't necessarily welcome and I certainly felt more comfortable being with a group of locals rather than a lone tourist. Six minutes into the game and the TIFO was finally removed and to our disappointment, Vishra were already 1-0 down. This did nothing to stop the chanting dictated throughout from the podium by the capo, megaphone in hand. With the joy of YouTube, I can now look back at the pyro display and the surreal footage of the Katowice goal. The home team had started the season with 10 points and 12, desperate for a return to the top flight. It was crucial they pulled back the deficit to continue their early season momentum. Admittedly, the singing of the fans was more captivating than the football itself. Vizio were the better team and dominated possession, but it wasn't until late in the second half when the game turned. The Spaniard Luis Fernandez entered the fray on 57 minutes, and within 20 minutes, he turned the game on his head with a brace. Jubilation followed with one of our friends even losing consciousness, caused by a flailing elbow amidst the celebrations. Vifa held uncomfortably for a fourth victory of the season, and the players came over to share the moment with the fans. If they can continue in this vein, then who's to say they won't soon be reconvening two of the most famous rivalries in Europe? The Holy War with Krakowia and the historical duel for supremacy with Legio Warsaw. Poland's two largest cities, North versus South, Capital versus Former Capital, and the country's two most successful teams of recent years. As the fans went their separate ways, a few of us headed back into the centre, but only for a nightcap with it being a weeknight. But there's always one. Always one who fancies another beer, and who was I to say no? With the 700-year-old Jagiellonian University, the 13th oldest in the world, placed in the heart of the city, there was still a vibrancy about the place that students bring. Before I knew it, we were in this beautiful stone-clad underground bar, a staple of Krakow nightlife. This one had the joys of karaoke and gimme 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 was entertaining the clientele, but the real drama came when it had to prevent a fight after one young girl, seemingly offended by another getting in on her karaoke song. God knows what happened, but after she walked over and clocked her across the face, it was time to step in. Unsurprisingly, that brought an end to the reverie and I was off to home to get some rest before the next day's tourism. Over the next two days, I took the opportunity to appreciate the things to do and see in Krakow and discover what attracts the 10 million tourists here each year. First up was another UNESCO World Heritage Site in the Vizlika salt mines, 
Still no idea how to pronounce it. A unique site which delves into the history of one of the cornerstones of Krakow's commercial history. Souls have been extracted from the site since the 13th century and houses some breathtaking rooms and displays. Despite this, I must say my highlight is you can taste the salty walls. The most well-known experience in Krakow is a visit to Auschwitz concentration camp. To put this place into words is well beyond my level of articulation. To see at such close quarters the conditions that people lived in and hear the stories of how they were treated is beyond harrowing. Having been to several World War II museums in various countries over the years, Auschwitz brings a deeper understanding and feeling to the events that occurred and is certainly worth a visit to pay your respects. Back in the heart of the city as mentioned before, the main square is a wonderful location to while away the hours, grab some food and drink while enjoying the live music. Horse-drawn carriages and street performers add a lovely ambiance to the square whilst you listen out for the bells of St. Mary's Basilica. The Jewish district of Kasimirz is a well worth a short walk, an alternative but bustling area full of cafes, bars and restaurants. Provides a slightly more relaxed and authentic vibe in comparison to the tourism heavy main square. Vavil Castle and Cathedral are also beautiful buildings steeped in history and legend that provide a beautiful welcome to the city. Add to that over 6,000 monuments of cultural and historical significance, and you won't be short of things to see in Krakow. Another enjoyable and eventful trip watching football abroad. Another country ticked off the list, and my time in Krakow was done. This time, opting for the more conventional bus option back to the airport. As with all my videos, I will rate Vizsla Krakow as a footy trip out of 100 across 10 categories. So, tier ability. Unfortunately, even the top division in Poland is not in the top 35 leagues in the world, so quality on the pitch is certainly lacking here. 3 out of 10. Atmosphere. Although it was an early Tuesday evening kickoff, the atmosphere was brilliant. However, a lack of away fans and full stadium took it away from the top marks with the party restricted to the ultras only. 7.5 out of 10. Stadium quality. Pretty nice stadium inside, if not the most aesthetically pleasing from the outside, but Generally in good nick. 6 out of 10. Beer and food in the stadium. Nice snacks and cheap beer which didn't require a fan card and could be consumed from the stands. 7 out of 10. Tourism in the city. One of the most popular tourist destinations in Europe with incredible beauty and history. 9 out of 10. Accessibility. Very reasonable flights and cheapest chips on arrival. 9 out of 10. The people. Apart from the scrap in the karaoke bar, all interactions were very pleasant. Eastern Europeans have their own hardened style but still very nice people. 7 out of 10. Stadium surroundings. Not too much to do or see around the stadium, but only a 30 minute walk from the centre. 4 out of 10. The club history. Over 100 years old and one of the biggest teams in the country, but without too much reputation outside of Poland, so 5 out of 10. Ease and cost of ticket pricing. Very simple, passport required with tickets available on the day, and also a great option through home fans, so no planning required here. 9.5 out of 10. So, in total, a rather impressive 68 out of 100, and a trip that comes highly recommended from me. In terms of personal accomplishments for me on this trip, I've now watched footy in 16 countries in the world, 11 of those in Europe, 20% of the way to completing the UEFA set. Thanks again for joining me on another footy trip, and until the next one, take it easy.